Hey, this is a walkthrough of the Elixir GCSE Computer Science Paper 1 sample paper. So this wasn't a real exam, this was just produced by the exam board to give an example of what a real exam would look like. So there aren't any grey boundaries, which is unfortunate, but it's still a paper you can practice. So the crucial information is it's now and 40 minutes long, and it's worth 80 marks. So if you had, you know, if you do a minute a mark, which is often suggested, you end up with 20 minutes better at the end. Although I would say that it's uh, maybe ambitious to do a minute mark. Edexcel like to do lots of one mark questions and that inevitably means you spend a bit more time on them as you need to process each one. So perhaps that is a bit unrealistic, but I think that's enough time easily to do this paper. Other things, I mean, you have to use black ink, but that's the same with all GCSE papers and you can't use a calculator, although maths is not ever going to be that difficult. Out of the two exams for this course, paper one is more theoretical, lots of content needed and less algorithm questions, so it's a more written exam than paper two. So there's a whole playlist on my channel that covers, well there's two playlists that cover both papers, but for paper one it's a long playlist so make sure you give yourself enough time to revise it. But basically all the content's there so you can use that playlist to learn all the content for this exam. If walkthroughs like this are useful, please like the video and subscribe to my channel. And if you have any questions or feedback, you can email me or leave a comment, of course. My email address is always in the description. But other than that, let's get started. For question one, we're told that computing devices are made up of many different types of internal components for whole manipulate or transmit data. And first, we've got to name the component that holds instructions and data for programs waiting to be run by the CPU. So this is RAM or random access memory or main memory. Not just memory by itself, memory is just a category for devices that hold data, including secondary storage, but RAM is what well, is directly connected to the CPU, and that's where instructions and, crucially, data are stored. This is called the stored program concept, by the way. So this is RAM, that's just a, a straight recall question. Next, we need to identify the type of memory used to make up for the difference in speed of two internal components. Well, this out of the options here is cache. Um, if you had registers instead of cache, that would also be true. Registers, you have buffer registers which are there to make up for difference in speed. So the CPU is much, much faster than RAM, and the transfer times before the CPU, so the CPU is this, I mean, it's directly connected to the RAM, which is where the data and instructions are held, and the, access to, the transfer times are much slower than the CPU can operate. So you have kind of an intermediate, perhaps on the CPU in some cases, but an intermediate storage called cache, which stores frequently accessed instructions, and that's much faster, partly because it's such smaller capacity, you're more likely to get a cache hit, because less time to search through and so on. So this is cache. C is about ASCII, so we've got the ASCII code for the character D, and that's 68 in Deanery, and we've got to derive the ASCII code for the character J in Deanery. And this is testing you on your understanding of how ASCII stores for character codes, so they're stored sequentially. So the character for D is 68, and the character for E will be 69. And so they are, as you go up the alphabet or up the symbols, the character codes go up by one as well. So that means F is going to be 70. Then you have G, H, I, J. And that's, so we want J. So that's going to be 71, 72, 73, 74. So J is going to be 74 in deanery. So no marks for working, but what you're doing, you're just working out the differences between your given character and the one you're looking for. So this is plus six, and then you add that to the code. So it's this sequential relationship. For DI, we're told the capacity of some storage media is measured in bytes, and we've got to calculate how many bytes there are in 3 kilobytes of disk storage. So, the relationship between units is you have a bit, then you have a byte, then you have a kilobyte, which is the same as 8,000 bits, or 1,000 bytes. So, we've got, in fact, so actually, so technically, a kilobyte, as I said in my video, kilobyte is in terms of 1,000, kilo is the 1,000 prefix, but Edexcel like to do it in terms of 1,024. Unfortunately, you actually are incorrect about this, but you can't really argue with the exam board. So in fact, we're really doing 3 times 1,024 here, which is going to be 3,072 bytes. As I say, actually, this should be in terms of 1,000, so it should be 3,000. If Edexcel were being correct with the um, IEE standard, that would be the correct answer. So if you put 3,000, you should really be getting the mark or two marks for this. But be aware that Elixir seems to like to do it in terms of 1,024. For IO, we have to calculate how many bits have been transmitted per second for a network described as 3 megabits per second. So we're dealing in terms of bits, not bytes here. So we've got to be a little bit careful. And all we're really doing is working out what the M stands for, which is mega. And so I just checked the mark scheme, and it's a little bit confusing. I don't totally understand Elixir's logic here, but as I say, you've got to go with what they are suggesting. So they're saying that for storage, it is in terms of 1,024, but for transmission, it's in terms of 1,000, which is a bit confusing, but there you are. So if it was kilo, it's basically, for transmission at least, it's times 1,000, but for mega, it's times, it's, one, it's a step up, so it's times 1,000 times 1,000, which is a million. What am I doing? There you are, a million. 
and we've got three of them so it's basically three times a million which is three million and bits so the unit for bit is lowercase b okay we're jumping all over the place here but now we have to identify network protocol that is used for emails so first of all tcp ip this is the internet protocol suite there's a whole stack of protocols so tons of protocols including email protocols or email protocols use tcp ip i should say really but that's not specifically for emails so that doesn't count wi-fi is not for emails specifically now it's http this is for transmitting hypertext or documents over the web and finally the answer by default is going to be IMAP which stands for Internet Messaging Access Protocol and this is a inbound mail protocol we also have to know about SMTP which is an outbound protocol and POP Post Office Protocol which is also inbound so IMAP is where it's kept synchronized between the server the mail server and your your client whereas POP is not synchronized um, that's the difference between the two now we have to describe the process for communication in the client server network model for four marks so we want four distinct points here and first of all the server has got to be awaiting a request from a client so the server has got to start up first and the server has something the client wants so the client has to request something off the server but first of all the client has got to connect to the server so they need to know the address so the client uses the address of the server to connect to it so it'll be the IP address of the server let's do it in a different colour so hopefully that's the first mark the next mark would be if a client requests some data off the server and as part of this process the server has got the address of the client so using client's address or IP address the server sends the data so there's not really a fourth point here I imagine this will be using questions in the past I imagine this will be a mark as well so we have four in total but if you needed to say something else you could say something like the server is awaiting a request to start with you can't the server needs to be working for the client to be able to request something off it which is why servers are working all the time they're not just on occasionally next we're asked to identify the reason for using hexadecimal to represent data and our options are a user letter instead of digits that's not really a reason that's just, just a, a fact hexadecimal takes up less memory in the machine well hexadecimal isn't actually stored in the machine or data isn't stored in hexadecimal on the machine it's stored in binary or data stored in binary just because we showed it in you know uh, hexadecimal doesn't mean it's stored like that uh, it's easier for humans to read well that's true um, and the final one just to make sure we're not uh, made a mistake is that it's quicker for a machine to interpret well the machine is never interpreting it as I say it's all done in binary so this is by power of deduction at least the answer but anyway that's the whole point of using hexadecimal which shortens a long stream of binary so if you had four binary digits you can compress it to a single uh, value this is actually a in hexadecimal because this is 10 in uh, denary question 2 begins asking about compression so different types of compression are used for different purposes a travel company has designed some brochures that contain images and text in desktop publishing format and they send the documents electronically to a printing company for them to be printed explain why the travel company uses lossless compression to send the documents so two types of compression lossless and lossy in lossy compression some of the data is actually deleted to reduce the file size whereas lossless uses algorithms to make it more efficient to make the storage more efficient but crucially no data is lost hence the name and for documents like this it's very important you don't lose any data because once you once you uncompress it at the other side you can't get back the text or images you've lost Whereas if you are watching a video and you want it to be um, a smaller file size, you can sacrifice some quality by using lossy compression. But with text, you can't just cut off some character codes, otherwise it ends up looking different to how it should be. So no data is lost. So it can be, can be uncompressed back to the original. So I didn't actually look at the next question, but we were asked about lossy compression, so we've got to state two characteristics of lossy compression. As I've said, some data is deleted, and so the consequence is it cannot be restored directly. And that's just doing the opposite of what we just said, so a third, perhaps better one, which would also be true, is it's, it removes data which is least likely to be recognised. It's not going to remove the core data in an image. It's not going to remove the colour red. It will remove a, a shade of red which is unnoticeable to us. See so what asked about a method to perform lossless compression or on length encoding. Uh, so we've got some data for an image shown here, so these represent the image colours. Show the result of compressing this data for the image using RLE. So RLE uses a what is known as a frequency value pair. So you'd often do it as like a, a list with little um, 
pairs of data and so we need to so a run length encoding a run is just repeated data so we've got three lots of b here that would be a run as is this four lots of g and two lots of r a single one on its own isn't considered a run but we still have to represent it so this would be written as we've got one two three three lots of b so you put the value second actually it doesn't matter which way you put the value it doesn't matter if you do brackets as long as you end up with distinguished pairs but it makes it slightly more readable if you separate it out so the next one we've got one lot of r a mistake is sometimes people don't put in the value or the sorry put in the frequency for a single one but that still needs to be represented by the computer and we have four lots of green and two lots of red or r whatever that is so you can format this as you like, but it's for, it's for frequency value, which is important here. So you can format them as you like, you can swap them around, but you've got to include the frequency value for all of them. Question three then, an engineer complains that her disk is too slow. She's been abroad and has used her Wi-Fi in different locations. She's checked that antivirus software is up to date. Explain how different types of utility software could be used to fix the problem for free marks. So the key bit here, a bit of exam technique, it says different here, so we need to mention more than one. And we've got three marks, so I would suggest we do two points, so two different types of software which could help, and then explain why they would help, i.e. why they would make the disk faster for a single mark. So two examples. First one I would say would be a defragmentation piece of software. So fragmentation occurs on a hard disk when you have, so you have your data, and then you delete some of the data. So let's just... Mm, so you delete some of this data and then you add new data in so you add some more data in but it's larger than the gap that's been left so you end up with data which is spread in two locations and it takes two access reads to access it so it, that's why it becomes slow and on an actual physical disk it could be on either side of the disk so the little magnetic read has got to spin around and it makes a little bit of a difference especially when it's all your um, data that's uh, fragmented and a defragger or defragmentation software will just rearrange this and make it more continuous. So defragmentation software rearranges data so that it's closer. For a second mark, the reason this could be too slow is because you've got so much data, it's pretty much full, it's got to search through the whole disk every time. So we can list software which could help with that. So compression software, as we've just looked at, will reduce file sizes. I'm not sure what else you can mention, maybe transfer software where you can move it to an external disk perhaps, but these are good, two good options. I mean, we need to explain why it can be used to fix the problem, we've only said what they do at the moment. So really what both are doing are reducing, or let's just say let's do this properly, both reduce disk access times, therefore it becomes faster. Like I said, for fragmentation you have to access each fragment individually, which takes time, and for compression maybe it's less pronounced but you have less data to access so clearly that's going to be uh, it's going to be faster overall now I'll give two reasons why high level programming languages are preferred for some programming tasks well high level language is written in almost everyday english so high level is what you would have done in class so java python visual basic where it's it resembles you know normal sentences obviously it's got a strict syntax but is not something like assembly which is well, assembly still uses little acronyms, or, mm, some of those acronyms or mnemonics, but um, we have, you know, add R1, R2, so that's assembly. So you have high level, and you have assembly, then you, what, and you have uh, machine code, which is zeros and ones. And so this is, but combined would be low level. And so it, um, the instructions more closely resemble in the English language. And the consequence of this is they're easier to read, easier to program, and so on. Uh, you could also say they'd be quicker to read or at sort of the same point. Um, another perhaps less obvious reason would be the fact that they're available on all platforms. So you don't get, so assembly language is specific to usually a family of processors but occasionally just an individual processor. And machine code is specific to definitely an individual processor, so the individual instruction set. So um, high level can be written in, you know, on Windows, Linux, Mac, doesn't matter. You, and whatever hardware you're using but you need a translator to convert it to machine code but we're not really worried about translating when we're coding it so assume there is a translator out there which it almost always is we can um, make it available on those different platforms so available on multiple platforms not specific to a single operating system or single bit of hardware for C we need to explain our software can be protected as intellectual property for two marks so IP is a very generic legal term for creations of the mind is what it's described as so in our case we're looking at software which is obviously created by a person so there are two ways of protecting software mostly you have copyright 
and you have patents. So you can choose either one to talk about here. I don't think you could talk about both. Well, I mean, you could, but you wouldn't get you wouldn't get extra marks for it. Obviously, you're capped at two here. So you'd have one point for saying you can use copyright, and one point for saying how it helps. So um, let's go with patents, perhaps, because copyright is sort of almost um, automatically applied. But patents, although patents actually. Let's not go with patents, I've changed my mind, because patents are a little bit controversial with software. Not all countries allow patents, and people, some programmers think they're not a very good idea for software. Anyway, so let's do copyright. So copyright copyright protects the source code. You, if you wanted to do the same with patents, so this is basically Mark 1, rest is Mark 2. Uh, patents would be, or patents would be, you'd register them, so you have to actually apply to, for the government. Copyright is pretty much, you, read, you can register copyright, but it's pretty much automatically applied. It's sort of just your right, but um, patents you have to apply to the government and submit a patent form and so on. A very fun question. Now we have to discuss the benefits of using subprograms when writing software solutions for six marks. Not my favourite type of question, especially when I'm writing on a tablet. Okay, so, so subprograms are out of line blocks of code that you kind of will define somewhere, maybe in a header file. So you have a separate file for definitions, then you have your source code, and you have your source code, and then you, you call that uh, subprogram. And the good thing about subprograms is you can repeatedly call them. So you can call them several times and you're not having to actually copy and paste the whole code in again every time. That was an interesting way of representing that anyway. Often you write a single point for each mark. So I wouldn't recommend doing it here. You could, of course, but I would definitely suggest you do three distinct points and explain each of them. So let's just do a little plan. Um, so most obvious one is reuse, as I just said. Um, you, you also have an interface which is useful for programming, you can hide your implementation details and it will also make it more readable and easier to test and so on. So let's talk about these three points and explain each of them. So let's say a subprogram only needs to be written only needs to be uh, yeah, only needs to be written once, then it can be called then it uh, then it can be called. So when you say called it means to Usually, so if you're so you have your sub program, that's the name of your sub program, and you supply any parameters to it in your line of code. So you can basically just reference it and it will just repeat the code that you've written above it or in a separate file. And it can be called multiple times without the code having to be repeated. I said something about interfaces, but we'll come to that in a second. A better or a more logical next one would be the um, readability. So you could say um, this also helps with helps improve readability. I think clearly having less code is uh, helpful for readability because you can, well, you only refer to one bit of code. So it also helps improve readability, uh, which which can lead to fewer mistakes. Basically what they want here, and the discuss, um, I guess keyword is what's important here. They want links between points. So if you just made is six distinct points maybe you wouldn't actually get full marks for that you you really want to connect your points and better understanding that's what readability is really um, the ability to understand or how well you can understand uh, understanding you could also leave this into testing are you saying that you um, only have one place to test your code and we want to link that so let's say um, any any errors are isolated to the definition uh, sometimes definition is just declaring the interface, but anyway, so program definition uh, instead of scattered throughout the whole program. And a final point which should be enough was I said about the interface. So what I meant by this was the uh, the definition is something like as I said I've, I shouldn't have deleted it. Subprogram. Well, you might have in some languages your return types. So say int your name of your subprogram and your parameters. So maybe you'd say int a string b i don't know what that would be but anyway that, that's just your interface and so you know as your programmer that the return type is going to be int so you're going to get an int back basically you're going to input the arguments an argument which is integer an argument that is a string and so you're programming to an interface you don't actually know what's going on as part of this sub program say this sub program was in a library and you've imported it but we don't want you to know the actual details perhaps because it's a paid bit of code I don't know it's written by someone else so basically you could change any of these details without affecting the rest of the program because as long as your line of code that calls this so probably just this bit stays the same you could change anything within this as long as it still returns an integer it's not going to affect the program I mean something will change because you've changed the code maybe you've made it more efficient maybe you've removed an error effectively it doesn't affect the rest of the code um, because it's effectively the, the information is hidden from you 
So practically speaking, you could compile this code and so you can't see the source code anymore. But if you tell them this is the interface, then you can sell it or whatever and they don't need to know the details of your actual code. So we just try and link this to what we're talking about. We're kind of on the theme of errors here. So we could say that any changes to the subprogram code won't cause errors in won't directly cause errors, I suppose. So it won't, won't cause errors as long as the um, let's say the return type. You could say interface return type and parameters are kept consistent. So that should give us our six marks. We've basically got a few distinct points, so we know what's going on. We understand how subprograms work, and we managed to link them together to a hopefully a relatively coherent answer. I don't know. You can be the judge of that. Question four is about networks, so the ability to share data via networks has many advantages but also disadvantages. And for A, we have to describe the role of protocols in a network for two marks. So this is really just for definition of what a protocol is. So a protocol is a set of rules, a set of rules for uh, or a set of rules so that to so that uh, so that devices can communicate. So without protocols, devices would just, I guess, spew data at each other. They wouldn't have any uh, way to communicate. You need to agree on certain standards, uh, which is what a protocol is. A patch for an instant messaging application is available. Explain why users of the application should apply the patch for two marks. So a patch is a basically a fix for the software, so uh, specifically for security. So um, for patch, a patch is basically an update. For patch will um, fix uh, any security issues. So without it, um, the user would be prone to um, a cyber attack, or we could say the user would be vulnerable to attacks, to uh, attacks, and the attack for this um, patch, the loophole this patch fixes. We're given a diagram of our home network here for part C, and we've got to describe our data is transmitted from device B to device C, uh, just for two marks, so really simple here. We have device B, it's connected with a wire to something here, which could be a router, it could be a switch, it could be a hub. Basically, it's a, a, a gateway and it's passing data to different devices. We've got Wi-Fi devices here, and yeah, so we don't really care about the rest of it, we're only concerned about B and C. So basically, um, if B wants to communicate to C, it needs to put the address of C into data, so it's sending some data, it's got to put the data into, so you've got your data and it's got to put it into little packets of data uh, with the address, so the address will be in the header of a packet and a packet is, and the header is smaller than the, the body, uh, which isn't really shown there, but it'll basically put the, put the address of C into the packet and so that's our first mark, so uh, address of C in data packet and the actual address might be well in reality it would be both an IP address and a MAC address on a local network a MAC address is much more important than an IP address IP addresses aren't very reliable to IP addresses train, change over time basically uh, address of C put in data packet and A, the device at A, let me know what this is, doesn't matter A will um, read, the, read the address and forward it on to C whatever device this is, let's say a hub, will have tables and it will know this address corresponds to C, it knows where C is, it knows how to get to C. Say it was going to a computer up here, it would know it has to go via C to get there. So it, they're, I wouldn't say clever, but they know how to forward the data correctly. So we've got a second six mark question here, it's about comparing cloud storage and storing data on servers in hard disks. And the scenario is um, a school discussing different storage media, the administrative staff want to use the cloud, the technical team want to use the servers which are actually physically located on the school's grounds. So again, we're not looking for distinct, uh, not looking for six distinct points here, we're looking for maybe three or four, I mean we're comparing them so we want a, a point for each side, but we're looking for a more coherent, sensible, knowledgeable answer really. In order to be coherent, you might want to jot down a few ideas perhaps, so I mean, you can link them together. So first of all, you need a connection for um, for the cloud clearly via the internet and this could be a good or bad thing if you are a teacher and you're commuting to work or you're working from home accessing it on the cloud is clearly going to be very useful but from a technical point of view having a connection is not guaranteed so if the school's internet went down the technical team are going to be sweating even more because the teachers can't access any of the data so it's clearly a disadvantage there as well so that's a nice comparison 
Another nice point is you can very easily scale up capacity. So if you um, they had a, a bigger intake or they were backing up something, they basically needed more storage. That's very easy to do on the cloud. Just get you pay a little bit more, and Amazon have got enough data to deal with just a tiny increase. Whereas you might have to actually get a new server, buy a new hard disk, which is a bit of a pain. It's very easy just to upgrade your plan. Another one is the cloud. So these are both advantages for the cloud. A disadvantage for the cloud is that you have to, or they have security. In fact, they could be both. You would generally trust that Microsoft or Google or Amazon have very good security compared to your school, but it's not necessarily. I mean, this is more to do with physical security. If you're, if you have a network, a LAN on your school that's disconnected from the internet, hypothetically, their security is more going to be physical based. If someone comes in and steals the hard drive, then that's an issue. But in terms of the network security, I guess Amazon are a bigger target basically, or any cloud provider are a bigger target, although they should be spending a lot more money on security. So that could be a plus or minus. And the related point to that is if, say, uh, there was a, a cyber attack on the cloud provider and data was lost, or there was an accident and data was lost, it's kind of, it's, it's the cloud's fault, but the school would be held responsible. Obviously, the school is storing lots of details about children, so that's, um, they've got to be especially careful for privacy reasons. So the school is definitely responsible if something goes wrong server side. Okay, another good bit is to write it up. Uh, so my first thing I said was access to cloud storage requires an internet connection at all times. Uh, this means cannot be accessed offline, unlike the school servers. And the cloud data can be accessed outside of the school, which isn't necessarily the case with uh, internal servers. Maybe the next logical point would be to say about security. So um, creates security vulnerabilities. Whereas at the school, the issue is more to do with is more to do with physical security, which is easier to manage. As I said, if any cloud security fails, then it's it's the fault of the cloud provider, but the school is held responsible if any private data was leaked, for example. Let's maybe mention one more point. Uh, yeah, one more. Uh, yeah, let's do at least one more. So, let's say what I said about the ability to scale up storage the capacity can be scaled up easily as opposed as opposed to having to buy and manage a new server. Uh, you might want to uh, in fact let's uh, throw an example so we haven't actually related it to the school particularly we've talked about private data but that could be for any organization so let's get rid of that and do uh, e.g. if the school expands I don't know how much the school would particularly care, but environmentally it's better to use a large data center as opposed to having individual servers, which you don't necessarily cool down, or you might cool down with air conditioning or something, which isn't very efficient. Whereas a large cloud provider would have a large facility, which is very efficient because they want to save as much money as possible. Uh, so I won't write that up, but I think that should hopefully be our six marks. Question five is about embedded systems, at least initially. So we've got to explain one function of the embedded system in a washing machine. Uh, for two marks. So embedded system is just a, a small computer within a larger system like a washing machine, so it does a very specific function. Bit of a harsh question here, we've got we've got to make it two marks worth and I don't think when I was 16 I would have really known what how a washing machine worked to be honest, which probably says more about me than it does about Edexcel, but anyway um, yeah, a bit of a harsh question, I didn't think you'd get a question like this. I mean obviously this is no theory, this is you just trying to apply what you know, so uh, I would say something like the temperature of the washing machine, but clearly that needs to be kept track of. You, you set the washing machine to a set a temperature and it needs to maintain that as it gets cooler. It needs to it will have a heating element which actually heats up the water. So we want to, um, so it would maintain a temperature, perhaps plus or minus a few degrees, uh, adjusting, or in fact, let's say it maintains a temperature Maintain, maintains the temperature by monitoring monitoring the temperature by adjusting the heating element. So a bit of a dodgy question, every exam has one, not much you can do about it unfortunately. A much more comfortable question now, we have Boolean operators which are used in embedded systems and every system basically. We've got to draw a truth table for the Boolean operator AND, so three operators AND or AND NOT. Uh, this is very simple, just a single mark here, and a truth table shows all the combinations of this operator. So an AND operator, if it was a logic gate, it would look like this. It has one output and two inputs, and they're in binary because it's boolean. Two inputs we can call from what we want, so maybe P and Q, and then the output, and 
there are two inputs, so four possible combinations here 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. To work that out, you can see we're, we're counting 0, 1, 2, 3 in binary. That's a way to work it out. Uh, and the output for both. So, and for and to be true, i.e., for 1 to be the output, both inputs have to be true. If the inputs aren't tr both true, it's going to return 0. So, this is our answer. For all, one of the inputs could be zero and it would return true if this was an OR gate, which looks more like this, and then with a NOT gate it's just going from one to zero, only one input for NOT. For part three we have to construct a Boolean expression for this following scenario. So we have lights in a room controlled by an embedded system, there's a power switch representing with the value P of the variable P. We have a movement sensor which turns the lights on as a person there provided, which is really important, so that's going to help us. Provided the power switch has been left on in the on position, so the power switch needs to be on for the sense to have any effect so this immediately tells us we're going to have an AND operator between these two but we also have an override switch represented by the boolean variable O or is it, uh, yeah O and it will turn the lights on regardless of the state of movement sensor so these two are also connected and so let's provide the power switch to be left in the on position okay so there's also an AND relationship between these two and this was going to be regardless of the state of movement sensor so this is going to be OR so I don't know how obvious that is but once you do a lot of these you can quite quickly work out what's going on so let's just check that logically so we've got a, in fact it's probably best to write this out so how this is going to work or one of the ways this could work would be to go M or O in brackets and then AND uh, P so let's talk this through them basically as we've said for AND both sides have to be true for the effect to be true i.e. the lights get switched on so if this is off if the power switch is off then the lights are never going to get turned on because one side of this expression is a zero and, and means it will be zero. So this is, the, this is the important switch, not the override. This is what is defining whether it's on and off. This is the control switch basically, as it says here. Uh, in terms of this side, then the, the sensor can work, but the override is what will turn the lights on regardless. If for, if for some reason the sensor is down and this is a zero, then you can make this become a one by changing by switching on the override switch and so it'll be 0 or 1 and so this will be 1 as we said above so it'll be 1 and whatever P is. So P is the defining one here but this is just a way of nullifying the effect of uh, the movement sensor which may be unpredictable. Because of the nature of Boolean expressions there's different solutions which are equally valid you know, you've got to be a little bit careful with the brackets you've got to kind of evaluate this first and there's a, a precedence in binary so in boolean I should say. So another option would be you could do it will be P and M or uh, O and P. So P has got to be in both to define. This is just a, 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 a rule for both are equivalent. It's called the distributive law for AND but you don't need to know that. Bit patterns can be used to represent the different states of an embedded system. These bits can be manipulated by several different operations. Identify the result of applying a logical shift left by 3 to the 8-bit binary number, this. Um, so a left shift is a way of, or a logical left shift, so there's also the arithmetic left shift, or arithmetic left shift, which is different, uh, but we're looking at uh, logical here. So we're basically just bringing in a 0 three times at the end. So a quick way of checking that they're not true is the fact this hasn't got three zeros, which is this isn't going to be true. Uh, another does this one, another does this one, so actually it's going to be this one straight away. But um, that was surprisingly easy. So basically the first three here would get lost because they've moved three across. And you go got to bear in mind this is a single number even though there's a gap in between. That's just the way it's written. So these three would go, it would be 101010001001000, yeah, so this is correct. For 6a, we're told that algorithms used to store images, solve problems, encrypt and sort data, and to control devices to do everything basically. We're going to stay what's meant by the term algorithm for two marks. So an algorithm is a set of instructions that perform a specific task. So not a million miles away from the protocol definition. Not much more complicated than that. The two marks being a set of instructions and they do a specific task, so they're focused on one of these things they've talked about. We've now got to give two reasons why an unauthorized person can understand encrypted data. Well, first of all, the data um, is made unreadable by the encryption process. It becomes ciphertext. The data is unreadable. And the reason they can't read it is it's been encrypted. And crucially, they don't have the encryption, they don't have they don't have a means to decrypt it, i.e. they don't have the decryption key. And depending on the method, this 
It could be a number, this could be an actual process. Basically, the decryption key is a way of making the ciphertext back into plain text, i.e. making it readable again. And a key thing to realise is this is all about understanding. You can't understand scrambled up later. You can intercept it still. It's not trying to stop you intercepting, it's just making you not be able to understand it. A simple way to encrypt data is using a Caesar cipher algorithm and it's based on shifting. Explain whether a shift of plus seven followed by a shift of minus two is more secure than a single shift when applied to the word pink. And we've got to include a diagram in our answer, which is I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. So let's just work this out. So we're doing it to pink. So we're going from pink and let's do just plus seven first. So this is a little bit annoying to do. Um, uh, so I would be tempted to write down the whole alphabet, but I would just do it in my head. So this is going to be W, P, U, R, and this is uh, going to be plus seven. So I should have explained. Caesar cipher is a way of basically swapping the character in the alphabet by one down the line. So it, you, the key would be this plus seven. So to get back to your original data, you would do minus seven, and so. W is seven letters ahead in the alphabet of P, and so that's why you swap them, and then you do the reverse to go back. So this is unreadable, but you have your key to decrypt it back. And we need to do a shift of minus two again. So this goes to um, U N S P. This is minus two. So we have this kind of double shift here, and let's do the same with just uh, what is it? Just plus five. So yeah, the equivalent plus seven minus two is the same as doing plus five. So that'd be the equivalent. So this is a double. This would be a single, um, for the same way of doing it. You're just cutting yourself a bit of time and effort. So it'd be the same result as just going UNSP. So basically the point is, doing a single shift is no better than doing a double shift. This is twice the amount of work. It's still the same result. They're still easy to break. So both can give the same result. I'm not sure exactly what they mean, give the same result. I don't know if they um, expect you to realize it's plus five. You could do plus five, could give the same result. So no more secure. Um, a similar question came up in a different exam board paper, which is why I went straight to plus five, but I guess it could be talking in a more general sense. So no more secure. I mean, generally they're both, neither, even if this is plus six, it wouldn't be any more secure. It's the same same idea. And likewise, I'm not really sure what diagram they wanted. I, I suppose it would be something like this, just showing the process. Now I need to state what's meant by a pixel. A pixel is the smallest identifiable object in an image or object's not the best word, let's say unit instead. And it stands for picture element, but that's not really what we're saying, it's not really what it's meant. It's only a mark anyway. And we have a sample bitmap image with the following characteristics. It's a four bit color depth, and it's 100 pixels by 300 pixels. I'm gonna calculate the size of this image in bytes for two marks. So basically, the color depth is how many, how many bits are assigned to each pixel. And this is, uh, this is where you get how many colors you get, so you do two to the power of four is how many colors you'd get. And so each, so four is assigned to every pixel. So basically we have, this is our resolution. So we have 100 pixels times 300 pixels, which is gonna be 30,000 pixels in total in the whole image. And we wanna times this by four, which is gonna be 120,000. That's how many bits are stored in total, but that's in bits. So let's get it into bytes. There are eight bits in a byte, so you divide by eight. And so uh, 12 divided by eight is 1.5. And so if you shift that across and then add the extra zeros, that's 15,000. So there are 15,000 bytes in this, or this image takes up 15,000 bytes. And note the capital unit here. For you, we have a list of numbers and we've got to show the steps involved when sorting this using a merge sort algorithm for only two marks. So not many marks for understanding a relatively tricky algorithm. So this is a divide and conquer algorithm for sorting data. So we're gonna, let's put it in ascending, it doesn't actually say it could be descending, doesn't actually matter. Um, and it works by basically dividing the list continuously and it would be in a, in a real scenario, it would be recursively, and then it will combine it and reorder it so it becomes sorted. So first of all, it's divided, so it will split it in two, in two sub lists. So we on one side have uh, 84, 52, four and six. On the other side we have 68, 39, 53 and one. And I'll keep dividing and then we end up with pairs. So we could, this wouldn't actually happen when you actually implement it, which is a little bit confusing, but you don't need to know how you'd implement it. You would basically just put them into pairs. So this would divide again and we can just swap them here. So let's go 52 is less than 84. Let's assume we're doing it in ascending. Four is less than six, so that's okay. And again, they're kept separate. Uh, 39 is less than 68. So we can do that, and then one is less than 53. And then we need to bring two sides together. So basically we're splitting it here and here, and now we bring both together. 
and each each side to give us a four and six are less than these two. So what am I doing? Four, six, fifty-two, eighty-four. So they're brought together and making sure they're still sorted. These need to be brought together as well. So one is one actually goes here, so we've got to be a little bit careful here because these pet this, this entire pair isn't larger or less than this pair. So we have one, thirty-nine, fifty-three, and sixty-eight. And now both sides need to be brought together finally to give our final sort of list. So we end up with 1, 4, 6, 39, 52, 53, 68, and 84. So basically divide, divide, divide until you get to a point where you end up with only two items or in reality one item and then you compare it. But anyway, you basically end, you end up with a point where you can do a simple comparison and then you combine at each stage. That's why it's a divide and conquer algorithm. Okay, our programmer is writing software for a new set-top receiver for satellite TV. Explain why they should use a compiler instead of an interpreter to translate the code. So two translators, ways of converting from high-level code to machine code. A compiler basically produces an executable file, whereas an interpreter every time translates it. So every time you want to run your code, you have to translate it again using the interpreter, whereas a compiler just produces a single output file you can run and use whenever you want. And it basically, a compiler is faster than an interpreter because your interpreter has to do the translation process every time you want to run it as opposed to just a single time. So basically, this is going to be receiving data constantly. Imagine how much data comes in for a satellite receiver. You um, you don't want to waste time having to translate it tons of times. So um, needs to work quickly and compiled code runs faster. So generally speaking, there are basically two things you would talk about. So this would be, first of all, being quicker, of course, and also the fact that this source code is hidden, so you can't see the source code. The source code has got to be shipped with the interpreter as well as this, so also this takes up more space. But I think this is definitely the most relevant reason for this. For G, we need to stay what's meant by the term abstracting for two marks. So this is the process, this is a problem-solving technique of removing unnecessary detail or simplifying it, but um, yeah, either or, necessary detail. And the whole point of this is to expose or focus on the core aspect of the problem. So we want to start to focus on the crux or the core, let's say core, focus on the core of a problem, the most important bit of it. Um, and abstraction is used all the time in computer science. Programming in high level code is an example of this because you aren't focusing on what's going on at the hardware level. The operating system hides a lot of the details, so does the translator. The translator does a lot of the hard work for you and actually making it processor specific. You're just doing a, you're just solving a problem when you're programming as opposed to focusing on all, all the other details involved. And game software involves the use of algorithms and abstractions. A software game involves the use of two dice. An algorithm in this game is called roll. State the purpose of the algorithm roll. So two dice, each dice is gonna if you were to replicate what happens when you actually roll a dice, you also get a number between 1 and 6. And we've got two lots of this, so this algorithm would either produce a single number between 1 and 12, or it would produce two numbers between 1 and 6. So that's probably slightly more likely So um, to generate two numbers uh, between 1 and 6 each. And this would probably be randomly, or pseudo-randomly. And we've got to give a reason why the algorithm role is an abstraction. So um, the most obvious reason is it's it's a simulation, it's replicating, or it's simulating as for a technical term, simulating a real scenario with many more variables that are excluded. So when you roll a dice in real life, obviously there are loads of factors that are very, very small, like how you actually throw it, maybe things like the wind even, the surface it lands on, and so on. You can't include that in a program. So you are converting. So I'm sure there are statistics about a certain number being more likely when you're rolling a dice or something like that basically. But obviously you can't you can't replicate that exactly because probably don't people don't understand how that works. It's too complicated. It's it is mostly down to chance. So you're replicating it as best you can and randomly is kind of good enough for this problem. For the first part of question seven, we have to complete the table down here, which is a byte long. So we've got to complete each column for this. 
And we're going to show how plus 6 is represented in binary and how minus 6 is represented in 2's complement. Um, it's only worth 2 marks. So a little misconception is that people think binary is a huge topic because it's very quintessentially computer science, but it's really not worth that many marks in the exam. So unsigned binary, where we don't have a sign here, is just assumed to be positive. But as soon as we want to represent negative numbers, we have to use some other coding scheme, and 2's complement is the most popular. So basically, you would start off with working out plus 6 anyway, so let's do that. And we're going to do a byte here. So that's a little that's a little added complication because it will result in a different two's complement than if it was a nibble, for example. So plus six. To do it in binary, you want to use a table. So let's only go up to we only need to go up to four here, and then we'll just add leading zeros in. So four goes into six one time, remainder two, two goes into two, and then we have zero left over. So plus six in a byte would be one one zero plus five zeros to be a byte, and that's how long our table is. So we can fill that in now. And normally the leading zeros wouldn't matter, but for two's complement they do matter. So two's complement for process is you first of all take your positive representation like we've got here, you flip all the bits, so zeros become ones, and ones become zeros, and then you plus one to this result, which seems very strange, but it does work out okay. So one plus one it is a zero because you carry a one into the next column like you would with normal addition. Zero plus one is one, and then the rest of these are all fine they're all basically adding zero so let's line it up properly there you are so basically we need to copy this into our little table so straight away what tells us this is a negative number is the sign bit here this is the most significant bit the one to the furthest on the left and this tells us the sign bit so one is negative and zero is positive and the common mistake here would be that you would not use the whole table it does say it's not a million it's not super clear I suppose but it does say complete the table so you would have to fill in all the gaps if you only did it with one one zero you'd end up with well you'd need to do virtual zero here because it would overflow but you would do you'd end up with a different number if you did this and like all the questions there's a full video on my channel which explains this that covers it in more than 20 seconds like I did here and for part two you have to compare features of the two's complement representation of negative numbers with a sign and magnitude representation so an alternative to two's complement is this and we in this case we would basically just do if we were to do, to do it as a nibble, we'd do 1, 1, 1, 0, because we just have our sign, a bit like we have negative 6, we have our sign and we have our magnitude, it's replicating that. But there are issues, like for example, you end up with two zeros, so we end up with a negative 0, which is very confusing. So we, that's why sign and magnitude isn't really used, you have to be a little bit careful in circuits. And also, you can do addition with 2's complement, it always ends up working, whereas with sign and magnitude, it doesn't really work very often. So that is immediately two things we could talk about. So there are two zeros, zeros in sign magnitude, but uh, one in two's complement, which is actually plus zero, but it doesn't actually matter. One zero is better than two. Uh, and for a second thing I said was that you can do addition in two's complement. And so by extension, you can do subtraction as well because you can just invert it. But not always in sign of magnitude, you can in some cases where it's positive, but not always in sign of magnitude. So you really got to compare each point here. And then we have two 8-bit binary numbers and they're added and we've got to identify the letter it represents for true statement about the result. So the most obvious thing to do would just be to do the addition and it's extra practice as well, I'm not sure if you're meant to do that or not. But anyway, um, addition in binary is not very difficult. Again, there's a video on it if you want to learn how to do it. So you do 0 plus 1 is 1, we have 0 here, 1, 0, 0, carrier 1, 0, carrier 1, 1, 0, carrier 1. And we're limited, so we end up with a 1 here, but clearly the question is about overflow because we've got 8 bits here. And say we only had 8 bits available in memory, we've overflown into another memory cell. So this basically gets lost and we get a wrong answer because this number without this bit is a different number, so it's not going to be the answer. So basically, what uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. So that looks like it's the correct answer, but it's not the correct answer. That might, in some circumstances, that might be the actual answer received, but it's not the correct answer. So this is actually going to be D here, because none of them are correct. We haven't got our actual one put on at the end. If this had a one here, this would be correct. But I, you know, that's better for you because that could happen, but it's not correct. So sound can be stored on a digital device but only after being converted from its naturally occurring state which is an analogue and we're putting it into digital in this process. And so we've got a, a, uh, a graph here and we need to identify each of the items shown on the image in relation to the conversion required to store sound on a digital device. So A, B and C. So we've got our sound wave here which would be in, binary, in uh, analogue and we have to read it at a certain interval. So sampling works by basically at certain time intervals working out the value of the amplitude of the wave, i.e. the height of the wave 
and and storing it in binary, so a binary value here, which will be converted to binary, of course. So uh, B is going to be the sample interval, i.e. in time, so sample interval, and a similar term is sampling frequency, but frequency is not the same as time, so frequency is one over how many this, how many intervals per second basically but that's not the same thing so this is sampling or sample interval uh, B is uh, A is sorry the entire line so A is the sound wave and C as I said is the height of a wave or the technical word for that is amplitude and the final question of the paper is to explain the effect of increasing the sampling frequency for this sound conversion for three marks so we want three distinct points here and so as I said the sampling frequency is how many samples are taken per second and this is obviously going to be related to the sampling interval. So if you have more samples per second, or you have a, a larger sampling frequency, it's going to be more accurate. You're going to have more data points. You're going to end up with more data for this wave. And so it, it will be more like the original. You can see we've kind of got a very, it, it's kind of jumpy, isn't it? It's not, it's not a smooth wave like you would expect in real life a sound wave to be. And having more data makes it more realistic. So sound wave represented more accurately. The sound wave is represented more accurately. So we don't really want to talk about quality uh, because quality is our perception as a playback. We can talk about it in terms of the scientific way of measuring how accurate this is to the original wave. So this is going to be two marks and the third mark is more sampling data so you always end up with larger uh, file size. So it is the effect, it's not a positive or negative effect but increase, increases file size. And you always have to mention file size, it's the most important um, thing to talk about really, increases file size because they want you to know there's always a disadvantage to doing this. So that's it for this video, hopefully it was useful, please let me know if it was and like the video if it was and I hope the revision goes well and so does the exam, so good luck.